Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul with RP1 series in Kerbal Space Program 1.3.1. I am just getting back from winter vacation. All the videos that you've seen in this series so far, 1 through 6, were actually recorded on two days prior to my vacation and it's spaced out throughout my vacation. So I wasn't able to address some of your comments in a video because I was just reading them while I was out away from my computer. And uh, some of the comments like stuff about X science or simulation and stuff like that, I've anticipated because those are things that people have mentioned in previous playthroughs of RP0, um, although it used to be science alert, I think. But uh, one thing that's new and the thing I griped about was the rollout cost. Let's deal with that first. That's the, that's the topic of the day. And you can see the issue with this Able Core here. Uh, rollout cost 3,211.8, which um, which tells you something, right? It tells you that what's going on is that they bundled up a whole lot of other costs other than the actual cost of rolling this out. And th the problem with that is, let's say you're talking about the fixed costs of a launch pad. So people said that uh, the reason the rollout cost got increased was because I increased the size of the launch pad. And that only makes sense to a point. And here's the problem with that. Let's say you roll out a really big rocket, a really big rocket that fits on the pad. That makes sense. But if you just have really tiny rockets, but you're using that pad, and you roll out a whole bunch of them, you're paying more for maintenance. You're paying more of the fixed cost than you should be, uh, because they're charging you this baseline cost each time. And so you're rolling out this. Uh, you're just sending out all these tiny little rockets and paying more of a fixed cost. And that means you can't use the regular launch pad for a small rocket. Now you go like, well, then you just have another launch pad that's meant for the smaller rockets. And of course, the Russians used the same pad at Baikonur for all the R7s, and they just kept using R7s. So um, that might be our solution. Our solution might be that we're just going to have to use one rocket uh, like the Russians did. Basically, this whole thing is leading me to... The, the most economical thing isn't the Cape Canaveral solution where you have one pad for each size of rocket. No, the most economical solution is the Russian solution, which is to have one rocket, <laughs> right? It's to have the R7 rocket launch everything. And then you just have one pad to deal with. That's the economical solution. And yeah, that might be what we end up doing. So when I uh, responded to one comment, you know, I have a plan for this. Well, I have the, the plan that they actually had. And, you know, it, it's to my benefit that I know, you know, how things actually worked, of course. Which gets us to simulation. So why don't I simulate all my rockets? Well, to some extent, that would make it too easy, right? We have this, uh, this sort of simulation thing, and the simulation costs a little bit, this crash. And... It's always been my policy in the series. First of all, it creates more drama if I don't simulate it and I don't know what's going to happen. And second of all, I've done this a few times before, so I could just copy my old designs if I really wanted to and just eliminate the sort of uncertainty of it by using those designs. I mean, not completely eliminate. Some little things will have changed, but at the end of the day, what's going to happen, though, is that the only thing that would kill my rocket if I simulated it would be test flight. And that would make test flight really annoying. And some people commented that, you know, they were really annoyed with test flight and everything. I can't get annoyed with test flight if half the time the failure is my fault. If, however, I simulated or copy my old designs such that the failure isn't my fault ever, um, then I get into a situation where test flight is really annoying because 100% of the failure or maybe 90% of the failure will be due to test flight. and But I avoid that because I'm not simulating anything. And so half the time, it's my own derp. And that makes test flight a little bit more palatable. So there's that. Yeah, so that's part of the logic. I've, I've got other reasons, like just the sheer drama of it, but it does... I'm not going to get rid of test flight. I'm not going to tune test flight in any way. I can deal with test flight because of my own failures. <laughs> it's uh, it's an odd thing. I know it's an odd sort of logic, but there it is. Um, X science. Uh, let's take a look at the tech tree. Okay, so people brought up X science or some sort of science alert system uh, to warn me when there's science available. That's something that always comes up and I never use. And the reason I never use it is because I'm not 
first of all, I'm not in a hurry to get through the tech tree. It's not, I'm not a completionist like that. And second of all, actually, I would like to try and do as much as possible for as little tech as possible. And we're already unlocking things. You can see this uh, stuff is uh, considered research, but it's actually, we have to wait for it. Now, of course, we get more upgrade points, but it's not enough upgrade points to really speed up our research that much. We actually have to buy upgrade points to really speed up our research. And this is the thing. We don't really need the science very quickly because we've got research queued. It's going to take a while to unlock them anyway. Uh, so I'm not in a hurry to get science. I would like to accomplish as much as possible with as little science as, po as little tech as possible because that's more interesting for me. And uh, I also would like to be able to go back to a place and get more science. If I don't know that I've like milked all the science, then it's possible that, you know, I go back there and I should check, right? I should check my instruments and see if I got some science left over. And maybe I'll be pleasantly surprised. Um, I think that stuff like Science Alert and X Science uh, removes that possibility for me. And I, I find milking things and the completionist thing a little bit tedious in this case and uh, reduces my potential for a new playthrough because I, I try not to complete it, basically. I try not to complete everything. There are biomes like on Kerbin that I haven't really set a Kerbal on kind of thing. So uh, yeah, uh, basically that's the basic idea. And there's sort of a revulsion basically uh, deep down inside when it comes to the idea of like finishing science. You know, like taking a temperature reading in a place and then not having to take a temperature reading again, as if temperature is not a time dependent thing. There's a, I don't like the idea of science being like that. That's not how science is. You should take a reading again. And there's, there is a benefit to that. That's not being reflected in the science system right now. And so I, I don't like that sort of structure. And so I would like it to be like, I always try my instruments. Uh, check out whether there's any science to be had and just go like that. And sometimes I'll forget something and that's fine. That means that I'm leaving it for a future mission that might happen to grab it then. And that'll create enough, you know, uncertainty there where I don't feel like I've finished things. I never feel like I've finished things. And that allows me to continue playing through and that avoids some of the burnout sort of situation. Okay, so that's one reason or a number of reasons why I don't use one of those science systems that people recommend. And, uh, you know, it might be irritating to people that I'm leaving science behind, but again, I don't feel a particular urgency to get all that science when we take so long to unlock it and the upgrade points really don't affect our speed that much. We really need to make a lot of cash in order to buy upgrade points in order to really speed things up. If we don't have a queue, if we don't have any science queued up, then I think I would feel a need to milk some more science, of course. But I don't think we're going to have that problem. So I think that uh, covers the main comments. I'll look through the comments again to see if there's anything I missed. But let's get on with the business. Uh, we don't have enough time to finish this first navigational satellite contract. And um, let, well, I'll save the comments about build times some other time, but uh, they're a little bit annoying too. But uh, let me come up with a design to perhaps fill some other contract that we have available. All right, I'm trying to put something together and I decided to try and use procedural avionics to attempt something. And if it works out, I'll explain it later. But it occurred to me that there was one comment in the comments that I didn't address, and that was uh, on the usage of an upper stage configuration on this. Now, I have uh, just gotten the update uh, upgrade to early avionics here. Doesn't seem to do a heck of a lot, but uh, the thing is that I don't understand this percent utilization thing. So what somebody said was that they were able to uh, get a five ton core with uh, much lower mass than I normally have. And the reason for that is I normally set this percent utilization to 100% because that makes sense to me. But for some reason, it is possible to scale it all the way down so that you use 200% of it all the way to 200% here. And I don't really understand that. It's not, you know, elegant. I mean, it's, uh, there's something wrong with that in my mind 
But certainly that would be very beneficial if you just use 200% utilization, you can get this down to 66 kilograms. But I want to know why. Why, why is this 200% utilization that shouldn't be a thing? I, it just in my gut, I feel like I need to scale this up to, to 100% so that it's legit. But why is it possible to scale it down to 200%? I don't know. But I, I suspect that was what was going on there. And, you know, if we scale it up to 100% uh, utilization, here we see uh, 0 0.12 uh, uh, tons, 0 0.12 tons for a 5 ton uh, thing. And that makes sense when you take a look at the ABLE ABI score. That's a 5 ton core as well. That's 0.14 tons. So this is already a lot better than the ABLE avionics core as it is. It's a little bit physically bigger in volume, but uh, its power requirements are less. It only requires 25 watts compared to 150 watts for the ABLE avionics package. And you know, ABLE avionics was ultimately used for a fair amount of time. So the ABLE stage. So yeah, I don't know what to make of this. The power requirements actually seem somewhat Cheaty. There it was a probe configuration that was separate, so I don't know if that's something that we unlock eventually still or not, or whether that was just in an older version of RP0. Uh, but yeah, this seems right. I mean, the mass compares favorably. It's still less than the Able Avionics core for the same amount of avionics mass. Um, but it is possible to shrink this down and have half the mass. The question is, is that allowed? I mean, 200% utilization should not be allowed, right? Right? I don't know. I don't know. Um, so you guys are going to have to tell me what's going on there. Uh, can I? Can I? Can I do that? I mean, am I allowed to do this? Yeah. Uh, so I'll leave that to you guys. I'm not going to baseline the design on 200% utilization for now. But if later on you tell me I can, that'll just mean that the design is more capable than it was initially meant to be. Okay, so here's where I find out that batteries have to be tooled separately. Uh, apparently they don't share the tooling of the tanks. And apparently batteries are not just shoving a whole bunch of these batteries and linking them together. And that makes me sad. But okay, fine. We'll never use the procedural battery then because why would I pay for tooling when I can just slap one of these on or a bunch of these on? Okay, so I think I have some designs to show you here. And what we have is a sort of satellite bus here around a procedural avionics core, five tons, 100% utilization, 0.12 tons and batteries and RC, RCS for main propulsion here, HTP. So that's just an HTP tank at our other uh, tooled tank size. And these are at the same tooled tank size, of course. And these contain ComSat payload because there is a contract available for this sort of thing. And uh, we have some antennae here. And yep, that's basically the bus. And we've got a few token tiny solar panels as well though we really need to unlock better solar panels. This is all designed to fit within the 1.2 meter diameter size that we have tooled for already, though I, I had to tool this, um, what you call it, uh, fairing again, and that costs money. But uh, yeah, I think this size fairing is gonna suit us for quite a while, so I'm okay with that. This is our standard size tank, two of them, and of course uh, that is for two of the AJ-10s in here. Let me show you that in tandem with RCS using HTP. I'm probably carrying too much HTP, but it's 24 per tank right now. So that's less than we had before. I know that was a big concern, but mainly the amount of HTP I had been putting in the tanks was actually due to the tooling. I had set the tooling of the tank and then um, figured out how much time we could burn these for so a minute 55 and then uh, put the rest of the fuel as htp so yeah i mean that was probably a bad way of doing it but anyway um yeah so we have two tanks because we have two of these once we get aj tins that can burn for a longer time than one minute and 55 seconds we will just be using one aj 10 on this stage so that's the idea there 
Now we've got a few decisions to make. Uh, here we have a procedural AVI score, and it turns out that for this, the booster configuration, these are worse off than the other stuff that we have. And that's probably because I haven't purchased this early avionics. But I don't want to purchase that early avionics right now because it's 15,000. I've already paid a lot for tooling for all this stuff. And uh, so yeah, at uh, roughly 100% utilization is 1.141 tons. But that's pretty heavy compared to our Thor cores, which we have unlocked. And it requires two of these. I could have brought the whole rocket down to uh, be the capacity of one of these Thor avionics units, which is 65 tons. And they're only 0.2 tons a piece, so that's pretty darn good. And they're pretty cheap too. How much was the procedural avionics score here? Um, 539, so that's pretty horrible. Let's just get rid of that. We don't need to think about that anymore. So these guys are awesome. And uh, initially it was supposed to be tucked into the fairing, which is prefabbed, uh, sorry, uh, tooled and uh, placed here and then I uh, tucked the AJ-10s in a bit to accommodate the space but because I had already set the tooling for this but since I'm using two I have to use them out here. Okay and then the rest is a Juno 1 tank which we had unlocked previously and then two uh, LR-89 series engines and these are additional fuel for the engines because they can burn for two minutes and 15 seconds. We've got 2 minutes and 16 seconds right now. Um, maybe I'll just reduce the utilization for now because I'm sure we'll end up being able to use that extra time, probably more than that. But we've also got some additional length on this tank that we can use if we want to expand a bit. So yeah, that is one option to hoist this into space. You can see 8,951 meters per second. Uh, I estimate that the payload itself has about 400 meters per second for adjusting its final orbit. So all of this could deorbit uh, and uh, it'll complete its own orbit. And it's got full control because it's got that procedural avionics core and plenty of RCS thrusters. So that's the idea. And um, I called the bus the goober bus, I don't know why. I haven't really come up with a good name for this rocket yet. Uh, Juno is the core here. This is an a double able stage, a very able stage. We could call it very able or vag. No, that doesn't sound good. That's probably not a good idea. Very able, do you know it is? Okay, so that's option number one. That gives us 8,951 meters per second. Option number two is just to put an Atlas rocket here. So let's compare the cost here. Uh, here, 2,526, and then we just put a regular old atlas and this comes out to be 3,484 which is pretty darn expensive because we've got an additional engine here and I haven't put the launch clamps we don't have the LR 101 vernier thrusters yet so that's one thing we do not have uh, I wonder how much it costs to get those so and I don't have the normal atlas launch clamp here uh, LR 101 where are you? There you are. 8,000. I don't feel like I need to pay 8,000 for those. These gimbal, don't they? Yeah, they have a five degree gimbal range. So why the heck do I need those? Um, nope, don't don't really see a need to unlock those right now. Uh, you know, they could be, no, they only have a 238 vacuum ISP, so they aren't even possible as an upper stage engine. Really, we've got better options there. Now, thanks to the tooling fudge factor, we can actually reduce this size down. Uh, okay, that's too much, but there. So we can go down to, okay, right about there. And that makes that part look better. So I'm using the exact same fairing on both, but the top of the Atlas rocket happens to be smaller in diameter than the top part of the Juno rocket. So this is a very able Atlas now. It's got enough avionics because that's 130 tons there and we've got an additional five tons there. That five tons is enough. We can verify that for the upper stage. You can see four tons. 
Okay, so can barely get off the ground, so maybe we can underfuel this tank because we've got a lot of Delta V here. So it costs more, but it gives us 10,860, which well, after we get rid of the boosters, we probably have a lot more than that even. We could maybe fling this a fair way towards the moon. And this is with the commsat payload. If we had something lighter on top, it might be even better. Oh, I forgot to discuss a thing. Of course, we've got the rollout cost and rollout time to consider. I hear with the very able Atlas, the rollout cost is 11,845.3. And I've, I've said my fill on that topic. And if we take a look at the very able Juno, it's 9,356. So cheaper at least, and about 30 days quicker to build. But again, less capability. So, yep, that's how those two numbers shape up. If we take a look at the parameters for this first communication satellite contract, uh, we've got the tiny little solar panels on it, so it can generate solar power, though not very well, and probably not enough for that core, but I, I hope it'll be enough for the contract. Um, I have a CompSat payload of 158 units on the craft, we have 160, so that's good. And we need to put it at an inclination of 35 degrees, uh, 850 by 4,500. That sounds like we'll need the Atlas rocket for it. And it's uh, more than 10,000 meters per second. So, yeah. I, I guess that's what we'll have to try. Mm, the amount that they're going to give us... The advance only pays for one rocket, really. With completion, that sums up to four tries on this. But uh, yeah, not great. It gave us a year to uh, tackle it, which means enough time for three launches. Other options we have, we do have other possibilities. This is actually, this pays about the same, but this year looks a lot easier, doesn't it? Atmospheric analysis satellite. Apoapsis, those are fairly low, and we just need a temperature scan and barometer scan. Oh, and return science to KSC. Hmm, that's an interesting catch. But technically our little satellite bus should be able to handle that, right? Because it's got the RCS and can aim the little return portion for recovery. That's interesting. Okay. So let me think about uh, that atmospheric analysis satellite possibility as well. That Maybe that can launch in a Juno, and this can la launch on the Atlas. And we'll see. Okay, so procedural decouplers also have to be tooled. This seems a little bit weird, because the way decoupling works is there are actually devices around the tank. It's not actually like a cylinder like this. Um, I don't... I don't know if that makes sense or not, that the decoupler has to be tooled. But anyway, apparently the couplers have to be tooled. So uh, I'm going to go with uh, 0.48 form factor and tool this one. But you might have been wondering, how am I going to try and bring back this science uh, if we don't have a heat shield? Well, we're going to try something out here. Uh, we're going to use this bus and everything. But here we have a thrust plate multi-adapter and the reason we have a thrust plate multi-adapter is of course because it has a reasonably high heat tolerance you can see max temp internal 2073 skin temp 2073 uh, they cleverly prevented me from using an engine to uh, block the heat and that's because the upper stage engines all have really well actually the age of 10 is not too bad but the error b doesn't have very good heat tolerance and um, this AJ-10 doesn't have very good heat tolerance. This AJ-10 does. Uh, what fooled me was this one. This one only has 700, uh, 573 and 673. This one is actually pretty good. But it's still not worthwhile carrying the engine rather than the thrust plate multi-adapter. The engine is uh, about 0.27 tons. Oh, sorry, 0.027 tons. 27 kilograms more than this. And it doesn't quite cover the area and probably doesn't fit in the fairing very well. Now, it wanted us to do certain science, and I don't remember if that science is in the Explorer core. We might have to slap something extra on. But the idea is the bus is going to bring it to its required orbit, and then it's going to do the science, and then it'll deorbit it, 
and this will come back down and use the parachutes. We'll, of course, uh, prepare the parachutes prior to deorbiting. And we have enough delta V, that's for sure. Question is, can it be done like this? That I don't know. Or maybe we'll have to wait for the heat shields after all. But uh, what we should do is try it out first before picking up the contract and seeing how it goes. We could probably use some more data on these engines anyway. And we'll uh, build a preliminary atlas for the other mission as well. But we, again, won't pick up the contract just yet. Oh, wait. It looks like I was wrong. It's, it seems to be recover or transmit on these. But we should try out what we've planned anyway. It should be interesting. But yeah, recover or transmit is much easier. And let me just pick this up. Hopefully that's not going to be too bad, right? It really will allow me to just transmit the science, right? Okay, so I've built recovery one, which we're gonna attempt to recover, but it doesn't look like the contract requires us to recover. Also, I put the extra thermometer and barometer on the Guru bus and the Atlas one, which is mainly supposed to test a ComSat payload possibility. Uh, also, it turned out that the Explorer core does not have a thermometer, so I had to add one of those, and I just slapped on a barometer to balance it out on the other side. Uh, so, yeah, anyway. We are rolling this out. It's gonna take 10 days to roll out and I've got comments about that. Uh, probably the most pointed one would be, uh, it sure wouldn't have been possible to do ICBMs or V2 rockets or anything if it take, took 10 days to prepare a rocket for launch. Um, seems like they, they were able and are still able to do that much quicker if they are dealing with a small rocket like this or even an R7 style rocket. It uh, seems like they can roll it out and prepare it on launch pad in less than 10 days. Of course, I, well, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, not with that much of a budget. I mean, you know, it's not like they have um, many, many, many times the workforce that we do here, right? Anyway, uh, well, let's time warp daylight and then launch. So here we go. Ignition. We lost one engine. Uh, yeah, we did. All right, shut off. So here's another thing about the rollout cost. Because they're adding in fixed costs, we've got a bit of an issue in that we, you know, sometimes with test flight and Kerbal construction time, we have to roll back and roll out again, and then they're biting us on the cost again. And if they're adding in fixed costs of the pad into the rollout cost, that doesn't seem fair. Also, what's with this launch clamp anyway? That's bound to be a disaster waiting to happen, isn't it? Okay, well, all I've done is move the launch clamps to the right position, and that's got to take seven days. Well, let's not to think too much on it. Hopefully the engines will be all right. Well, let's get that T-tab back in, huh? Says one more ignition. Okay, so here we go. Uh, spending the extra 7,000 to rule it out again. Uh, oh, that one automatically ignited. Okay, activate this one. Alright, looks good. And throttle up and launch. Really launch. <laughs> it's always something. Whoa, whoa, it's going wiggly. It's going wiggly. Uh, maybe I need fins. Do I need fins? Uh, transonic region and everything. Ah, ah. Uh, way off, way off, way off, way off. Oh god. Oh. Okay, bad. Alright. Uh, maybe with Smart ASS properly tuned we could have held that, but... Yeah, that wasn't any good. I don't know whether they can bring all of this back down or whether we need to... dump some more mass. Oop, I think we lost a little uh, fairing base there. Uh, recover vessel. Okay, well, <laughs> recovery of vessel that uh, survived the flight, but interesting that it says 3,400 kilometers from KOC. I wonder if there's another configuration for stage recovery that would get us better value, but 
Anyway, recovered some stuff, but that's a disappointment. I might have to put fins on that. I should get uh, another one of those queued up just for test purposes. Okay, so here we are with the Atlas. Unfortunately, I didn't time warp till daylight, so it's gonna be a nighttime launch. I looked at my previous settings for MechJeb, which work pretty well during launch, though not necessarily so well for some of the more far-flung maneuvers. Well, when it's trying to just use RCS, uh, I don't think I've tuned that bit. But um, these numbers seem to match what I have there, which makes sense because I copied the MechJeb global config from my other installs into this. So it should have the same numbers. So I wonder why it's not working as well in this version. Curious, but uh, maybe it'll work this time. Atlas is an actual rocket, so hopefully it's stable, or at least more stable than my weird uh, Juno contraption last time. Okay, now we're just gonna try for the same contract, so no particular inclination issue. And uh, we'll get ready with this. Ignition. And launch. Now this doesn't have a very high thrust to weight ratio, so we can be leisurely about the pitch maneuver. Alright, looking good. It makes sense, there's got to be more pressure down here because of the skirt. So... I think it's sort of balanced, maybe? I don't know. Probably. Probably better balanced. Okay, so these can go for 2 minutes and 15 seconds, so we'll let go of the booster skirt at that point. And separation. Okay, there goes the skirt. We have plenty of time to apoapsis, even though the thrust weight ratio is a little bit low right now. This has a nice specific impulse in vacuum of 301, though we were burning it right from the start and it doesn't have very good sea level thrust, uh, sea level ISP. While we're using, you know, able engines, the AJ-10, uh, this sort of feels more like an Atlas Agena sort of thing. Now the contract just says above. It doesn't really set a limit to that, but maybe we'll keep it to close to that so that it doesn't get confused. Otherwise I would have liked to test how far out we can go with this. Interesting, I wonder why the stage time says 3 minutes and 20 seconds left? Oh, oh okay, uh, we've got an uh, imbalance here. Oh right, oh wait. Oh, because I refilled this, and there's this kerosene bit here. I should just empty that kerosene bit. Well, shucks. Technically, this engine can only burn for five minutes. But we'll see how long I can go for. Seems like this tank was designed for one of the later atlases. Oh, E slash F. Well, no wonders. No wonders we have so much extra fuel past five minutes. I do like the LR-105. And here it's going over time. Or maybe it was reading the right stage time after all. Well, we're above the right number. Okay. We can basically just flatten out now. Wow, it went all the way. Okay. Are we all settled? Seems that way. Oh, only one engine. So close. I should tilt them so that they're both through the center, but still it's not good. Uh, this ain't gonna work. Yeah, unfortunately the bus does not have enough delta V to actually make this up. We had plenty of delta V though. If that one engine didn't go out, I will enjoy it when we finally get to the AJ-10s that have more than a minute and 55 second of burn time. Oh well, anyway, uh, yep. 
We're just going to be over the water, so there's no point waiting for it, I don't think. And it shouldn't survive this. Well, we're getting into a tight sort of situation here. We've got another recovery one here, but that takes 84 days to build and the contract's up in 127 days. On the bright side, I mean, if the Atlas works, if we put a smaller payload on it, it should be able to get over to the moon, which I would like. And we're unlocking basic avionics and probes here. We can get the heat shields in entry, descent, and landing. I think we unlocked uh, one technology, and maybe that has better probe cores for probes. Let me take a look. No, I thought we had unlocked something, but I sure don't see that. I think what we did get was hydrazine. Yeah, wow, 15,000 funds. I mean, it's worth it, but I'm feeling a little bit light on the cash right now. Okay, I don't think we've launched this before, but uh, I have this Pioneer probe ready and waiting. It's got a lot of good science on it. Uh, it's a little bit heavy, but uh, worth it because it's got this magnetic scan and visible imaging and mass spectrometry and all. And I added uh, thermometer and barometer here, uh, especially to fill the contract that we want. But I, I was thinking that this would take less time to build and less cost to roll out than what we've got already waiting because, well, it was smaller, right? I mean, the Juno launch is about 70 tons. Atlas is about 100 tons or so, uh, more like 120. This is 17 tons, which is tiny by comparison. Cost-wise, it's only a little bit less than the Juno. And if we take a look, there is, uh, yeah, there is no tooling pending here so everything's tooled and the probe costs 170 which is modest right i mean the explorer probe costs about the same so no big difference there um but yet you know the, the overall cost is pretty high but the rollout cost is actually more for this than for the juno this is actually more than that and it takes longer to build, too. Which is weird. I don't entirely understand why. I mean, okay, two Vanguard engines and one AJ-10. The Juno launch has two of the LR-89s and two AJ-10s. Oh, and this does have an Araby, but it's just an Araby. But this, I, I just don't understand this. I really don't. I wish it would be more transparent about what goes into that because this is just a bafflement for me. I don't I don't even vaguely understand how a 17-ton rocket can take more time to uh, build and ha have more cost to roll out than a rocket that does cost more here than this does and is five times heavier. So this is not an option really because I mean this is not as good as the Juno option. Nope. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, so this this may never happen because it is too expensive. So given that, I've decided to rush build recovery one as much as possible. You can't get it above 50%, so it'll get done in 50 days. That's the best we can do, and maybe we'll have a shot at one more launch after that. I should probably get that prepped, and I think I'll make it an atlas if we can get that done in time, maybe. Okay, that's interesting. It only let me rush build to 40% on the Atlas, but we've, we've got that going, and it looks like that sums up to less than the deadline, but that's not counting the rollout cost. I mean, not the rollout cost, the rollout time. Cost is still on my mind, though, as we're down below 200,000 now. We can see that they tick down some fixed costs, so uh, every period or so, I don't know exactly what the timing is. So why they can't bundle in the fixed costs for the launch pad into that regular sort of maintenance cost that they take from our account, I don't know. 11 days to roll this out. I don't think uh, this Goober bus is going to be done in time. 
Because if this takes 11 days, that takes like, I think it was 13 days. And yeah, that's not going to be in time. It's still configured to do the commsat payload though. So we could do that. Uh, one engine lit. Well, we're going. <laughs> it did that thing again. Even though this is a totally new rocket, it's not the other rocket, but it still did the same thing. Sometimes, I mean, I put fins on even. It's not the same rocket. Do we have thermometer and barometer on here? Yes, we do. Well, there's, at least there's that. Okay, we'll try and control it with Smart ASS, though Smart ASS doesn't generally like fins. Serious wiggling. But I think that'll settle down. Nice big, big plume for this rocket. Oh, well, we're gonna have to coast. Okay, so throttle down. Um, separation, RCS, forward. Oh, I guess we don't have really good orientation RCS. We can deal with that one other way, so we will do that. Um, fairing set. Says very stable. Ah, oh, one of them failed. Again. I don't... I don't like this. Failed to ignite. Well, yes. Yes, it did. Well, uh, it's safe to say Test Flight really, really, really doesn't like this whole very able stage. I think I was tempting fate with it somehow. Hmm. Though, both of our rockets are sort of built around this stage. I suppose we could test the recoverability of this. Well, not really. I mean, we're at a fairly low velocity. Probably the thrust plate multi-adapter can handle it here. You know what? Let's see if the thrust plate multi-adapter in the Explorer core will auto-orient. Well, wow, it's really persistently tumbling, actually. Oh no, it's pointing the wrong way forward. But again, we weren't coming back from orbit or anything. Now, now suddenly in the transonic region, it starts to flip the way I wanted it to. Oh well. Okay, we've got parachute deployment, but I mean, we can't really fulfill the contract. Not unless we get some extra ants to pull out this Atlas rocket uh, compared to a normal team of two that we seem to have pulling these things out. And normal circumstances. This is a bitter disappointment. A contract that we should have been able to do with certainly with these rockets compared to our tiny little uh, Araby style rockets previously. And even the Araby style rockets we can't roll out in time or build in time for this sort of thing. I guess maybe I could. If I rush build the Araby rocket maybe it's possible. But I just have to pour money into it uh, in order to rush build it. Okay. Let's recover this little part at least. Well, tell you what, rather than make my final attempt at this contract in this video, I'm going to save it for the next video just in case you guys have some suggestions for how to deal with it in the next 66 days. We can try and build that one rocket that took 92 days to build. Uh, if we rush build it, maybe we can get it done in 50 days or so. And that one at least, well, I don't know if it'll take less time to roll out than the Atlas. Tough to say considering it takes so long to build it and has such a high rollout cost. 
The rollout cost on it is nearly 10,000. The Atlas is only at 11,000. So I don't know. But okay, well, this is where we're at. We spent a lot of money and we haven't fulfilled our contract. And we do have the possibility of using this Atlas to do the other contract, right? This first communication satellite contract. Um, it looks like as long as both engines on the upper state, well, all the engines involved actually ignite. We can do this with the Delta V that it's got, and it's got the ComSat payload on it. But that's an if. There's also this one, which is an option. There are contracts available, and with the Atlas, certainly we can swing the lunar flyby impactor and maybe even the orbiter contract. But can we rely on its upper stage or its lower stage? <laughs> All the stages. That is the question. So. With that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.